and get started. Uh, we are recording this evening, so I've just started the video. Um, and first up, we're going to have uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to have this panel for you. We're going to start off with some opening remarks from School of Law Dean Sudaseti. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, as Ariel said, um, I think I know most of you, but my name is Sudaseti. I'm the, the Dean of the Law School. And I just wanted to uh, briefly welcome everyone here and, and particularly take a moment to thank uh, different folks who were instrumental in bringing this program together. Um, uh, I think uh, great thanks goes to Ariel and the Center for Social Justice and the Women's Law Association here at the law school for hosting this event. But really, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's the judges who are the prime movers here. And I really uh, appreciate them wanting to bring this conversation to the law school and particularly uh, Judge Horan for her uh, reaching out and, and saying, uh, would this be a good activity and how could how could we uh, engage with the law school community and I just I, I, I'm deeply appreciative of that uh, we are all in uh, a year and change into uh, a world in which there are many other pressures uh, and demands on our time that might not uh, might or ordinarily exist and so uh, uh, we're deeply grateful for engagement with the greater law school community and helping um, students and others think through what their career paths might look like and I want to just say uh, on, on that note, uh, just a, a moment about the importance of having this conversation at this stage. Um, it's often the, the case that people don't think realistically about being judges um, until they've had some time uh, of practice or other work under their belt. And then um, someone starts talking to them about the possibility of being a judge. And it, it maybe is an awakening, right? A moment to say, aha, maybe I could uh, choose this as a career path. And the idea of uh, planting that seed now with law students, I think is fundamentally important because uh, it's been the case for too long in Massachusetts and all across the country that, the, that oftentimes women and people of color do not think of themselves naturally as like, oh, I would be a good candidate for the bench. And yet, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's preparing yourselves for a, a pathway that would lead more likely to a judgeship, it takes time and it takes energy. So planting the seed now and encouraging uh, folks who are underrepresented on the bench to be part of that conversation, I think is a really important and valuable thing to do. I know that at the center, Ariel and I have spoken with many folks who are deeply concerned about this issue in, uh, in Massachusetts and beyond. And, and I think we're really proud to be a part, some small part of that conversation on how we can increase uh, what uh, the, the uh, like understanding why the bench is the way it is now, but also looking forward to how can we build um, uh, better structures to help encourage more people who have been historically underrepresented to, to be on the bench. So um, with that, I just wanna say welcome and thank you for this conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to the folks who are better experts in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Zetti. Um and so we're, as I said before, we're so excited for the panel that we have here tonight. Um, the folks that are on the screen have been brought to you by the Center for Social Justice, the Women's Law Association, and especially the National Association of Women Judges. Um, and we have with us um, Judge Horan, the first justice of the Central Division of Housing Court. Um, Judge McGuigan, the Associate Justice of the Worcester District Court, Judge Walsh, who's First Justice of the Northampton District Court, and Judge Eaton, who's First Justice of the Hampton County Juvenile Court. Um, and I just wanted to say, they're, they're going to sort of introduce themselves a little fuller at the start of the panel. I just wanted to say a little bit about this organization, the National Association of Women Judges, who's sponsoring tonight. Um, they were formed in 17, sorry, 1979 um, and have inspired and led the American judiciary in achieving fairness and equality for vulnerable populations. Uh, their mission is to promote the judicial role of protecting the rights of individuals under the rule of law through strong, committed, diverse judicial leadership, fairness and equality in the courts and equal access to justice. So we're so grateful that they, through Judge Horan, has brought us this panel tonight. And um, without much further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Audrey Kettle, one of our um, law students here at the law school. 
who's going to moderate tonight's event. So just a quick reminder, uh, make sure that you're on mute if you, um, as soon as you join, and unless you have a question, we're gonna ask you to stay on mute. We will have an opportunity for question and answer at the end. So feel free to put those questions in the chat and we will moderate those and get to them at the end of programming. We'll also allow you to, uh, we're doing a meeting format intentionally tonight because we wanna hear from you. So if you have questions directly from for the judges, this is your chance, you should speak up um, and, and ask them directly for, for some answers. So uh, Audrey, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you again um, for everyone being here tonight. Uh, we'll start off with kind of a simple question for the judges. If you could please uh, introduce yourself uh, as far as the position you maintain as a judge and what was your path to that position if you were appointed or elected? We'll start with um, Judge um, Haran. Which... Sure. So, um... I was appointed by Governor Salucci in 1999. Um, I was the youngest member of the housing court to be appointed and also the first woman to be appointed in the housing court. So if you think about it, in 1999, I was the first woman. That kind of says a lot about things. Um, and uh, I am the first justice in the central division of the housing court, which is located primarily in Worcester, but covers all of Worcester County and part of Middlesex County. Um, I came here by way of a, 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 a circuitous path. Um, and, and I'm gonna tell you a really quick story about how I got here. Um, there are three events that, that led me here. The first was my first job. It was at Burger King. And um, I got fired on the first day by a gentleman who weighed about 400 pounds and had his jaw wired shut because back in the day, that's how you went on a diet. And so um, suffice it to say, it took me a while to understand what he was saying, but by the end of the day, I realized I had been fired and I called my mother and she came and picked me up. And I went home and then I proceeded to work for my father for a few years because I kind of lost my courage. Um, the second event that defined me was my first legal interview, which was at Western New England. Um, I'm a, a graduate, 1985 graduate. And I interviewed for Mass uh, Commission Against Discrimination. And I thought the interview went so well. And I was walking out of the interview and um, I have two different size feet, an eight and a six. And when I closed the door, finishing the interview, I realized that my shoe, because I bought a size eight, being a law student with not much money, my shoe for my right foot was inside the door and I was on the outside of the door. So I had to knock on the door and get my shoe. I again called my mother and she came up and visited me because I was absolutely mortified. However, I got the job, um, which was uh, a, a godsend. And my third a thing that defined how I approach everything is business organizations, uh, a mandatory class at the time I was there. I'm not sure if it is anymore, but it was a mandatory class and I failed it. I failed it because not because I didn't know it. I knew it really well, but I had one of those, oh my God, you think you're not dressed moments and just completely lost um, everything in my head the day of the exam. There's no other explanation, but I had to take it again. So another humbling experience. And um, from that, I learned sense of humor and humility. And that has guided me this entire, uh, entire career, which is, I, I've been here 21 years. So um, I'm going to leave it at that for now. So. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to Judge Walsh. Nobody wanted to go after Judge Horan's amazing story. Like, I just want to sit here and listen for another 45 oh, minutes about her life. Um, so She's got was, a full 45 minutes of those stories, too. <laughs> sad, but true. Yeah. I love it. Um, so I also graduated from Western New England School of Law, or University School of Law, excuse me. Uh, in 1991, I clerked for a federal uh, district court judge. I think the best, Judge Michael Ponzer in Springfield, Mass. Uh, and my path to 
the judiciary was I was a prosecutor in the Northwestern District Attorney's Office, um, which I loved, a job I loved very much. And an opportunity came uh, before me to uh, do something that I had never really considered. And it was a little bit of an unusual path to the bench, which uh, presented itself as uh, being a member of the parole board. And then finally, the chairwoman of the parole board, the state agency that makes determinations as to whether people are being released from prison, whether uh, sentences are commuted and pardoned. Uh, and so I did that for 10 years um, and then was appointed by uh, uh, Governor Patrick uh, some 13 years ago. So that's the, the shortened version of uh, how I got there. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to next to Judge Eaton. Uh, so hello everyone. Hello Judge Grace, one of my inspirations for uh, for joining the bench. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, I uh, have been a judge for about 12 years. I also um, graduated from Western New England and um, I will tell you one of my formative jobs was, <clears throat> excuse me, in law school where I um, worked as a law clerk at one of the larger firms in downtown Springfield and um, really got an idea that um, law was a little rougher than I thought from, I think I was first inspired by um, LA Law on television. All of you are too young, but if, if you ever have a chance to look up an old episode of LA Law, you will see a lot of um, little ties at women's throats and big shoulder pads and uh, a lot of drama, but um, it just seemed so enticing. But when I worked at a real law firm, it was much less glamorous and um, a lot of hard work. So um, I, I think that uh, working there during law school was very helpful in uh, getting an idea of what I was, what I was getting into. Um, after law school, I, um, I, I hung out my shingle for about five years and uh, started doing trainings for court appointed work, um, uh, criminal defense, juvenile law, really felt myself drawn toward the juvenile court and juvenile law. Um, I did some appellate work for some of the juvenile attorneys. Um, at, at the time, they could designate their own uh, person that they wanted to handle the appeal as long as I was on the, the panel of, of trained attorneys to do that. And I had learned appellate work at the law firm I had worked at during lunch, uh, during lunch, <laughs> during law school. So, um, so that was helpful. Um, but my path um, to the bench then took a turn toward, uh, toward uh, working for the state. So I worked for the Committee for Public Counsel Services um, as a staff attorney, and uh, it was a pilot program back then. It was before there was really a children and family law program in Massachusetts um, for court-appointed attorneys. And uh, so I was in the first team that developed that program, gathered data, and it's still a, it's still a functioning program now uh, where you can be a staff attorney working for the Commonwealth um, representing parents and children in child welfare cases. So that was, uh, it was new at the time, um, back in the mid nineties, and uh, they persisted today. From there, I, I stayed in government work and went to work for the Department of Children and Families um, as an attorney, um, I'll say prosecuting, but they're really civil cases um, where there are allegations of abuse and neglect. And um, from there, um, I took a path similar to Judge Grace. I, uh, I worked in a clerk's office, became a, an assistant clerk magistrate. And uh, one of the things as a new attorney that also surprised me was how important and how seminal the, uh, the folks who work in the courthouse are to the, to the function of the court. And uh, it's important to get to know them when you, when you do get out there. Um, and then from there, I, I, I applied for a judgeship and. Uh, I was appointed by um, Governor Patrick about 12, 2009, 2009. I, I will tell you that um, judges like Chief Justice Grace, who's with us today, she was uh, an amazing judge to watch in the courtroom, but mostly her, her demeanor, her, her belief in us as public servants and um, the dignity that um, every litigant deserves was a real inspiration to me. So I. I uh, urge you to find those folks in your life who inspire you because I think that being a judge is a higher calling and, um, and I thank Judge Grace for that inspiration. 
Wonderful. Thank you for those kind words, uh, especially to Judge Grace. Thank you for being here. And let's see, next we'll go to Judge, um, sorry if I bought your last name, McQuigan? Is that right? McQuigan. McQuigan. Thank you. Um, so thank you to uh, Dean Setti and to Ariel and her organization for having us. Um, I, am the, I think I'm the only one on the panel that's not a Western New England um, alum. I did apply, I did get in, but it was a, a circuitous path, somewhat like Judge Horan's. Um, I did my undergrad in here in Worcester um, at uh, Assumption College, and then immediately out of undergrad went to Northeastern uh, School of Law, and I quit after about two weeks. Just wasn't working, wasn't a good fit, um, wasn't good timing, and I went to work. I get a real job at an insurance company pushing paper around my desk for about a year and then kind of looked up and said, I got to go back to school. So I um, ended up going to uh, Wake Forest University in North Carolina for a little change of scenery um, and uh, graduated in 95. Um, I will say during law school, I um, did an internship um, for um, a law firm here in Worcester that I, I had met through an alum. Um, so once again, let, let's plug these things that you can do to help you um, connect with an alum. It can help you with your first job and every job thereafter. Um, so I did some consulting and some work while I was in law school and then worked for them in the summers uh, when I was out of law school and I had to, uh, I had to waitress to supplement my income. Uh, that's how much money we were making back in the day. Um, I um, ended up uh, working with them after graduating um, for a few years, um, a, a diverse private practice. Um, and then I took a job with the city of Worcester uh, as an assistant city solicitor. Uh, so I was in-house counsel doing municipal law for about a dozen years. Um, and in fact, took over this, the chair, the very chair and desk that Judge Horan had vacated uh, at the city of Worcester. Um, she left some candy in the desk for me, and I appreciated that. <laughs> um, at some point, kind of kind of hit a glass ceiling. Just there was no room for movement for me. Um, and I had gone to a bar association seminar on how to become a judge. Um, and it was, as Dean said, he pointed out in the beginning, um, sort of an epiphany that oh, women can do this. Interesting. And I just kind of stored it away and thought about it. Um, I, you know, I can't say I went to law school with my eyes on becoming a judge. Um, that was not a career path uh, I had expected, but I did enjoy public service a lot. I enjoyed working um, in government, in municipal law. Um, so I ended up applying. Um, I, too, was appointed by Governor Deval Patrick. I was appointed in 2010. Um, to the Worcester District Court. Um, so I'm an associate justice in the Worcester District Court. And um, I, in 2010, was the third woman in the Worcester, in the district court in Worcester County. So in all of Worcester County, I was the third woman to be appointed as a district court judge in 2010. So. Well, thank you so much for that inspiring story. I know that quite a few of us here at the law school or just in general uh, maintain that same position where there is, as a paralegal, there was a glass ceiling for me. Um, and there was a moment where uh, being in court, knowing that I couldn't be a judge if I had never gone to law school and that you can still be a, a judge uh, at any time. Um, so I really appreciate that because I think a lot of people um, come to that conclusion where they, they wanna give back or do some sort of public service as well. And you can do that as a judge and not just as a lawyer. Uh, it, it sounds like the four of you uh, and knowing this have been appointed in Massachusetts. So could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Uh, was that something you prepared for? Was that something somebody approached you and asked you if you wanted to do this? Or is this something that you said, I'm going to seek this out now? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that first. For me, it was a, a bit of a, uh, a unique situation, although Judge Eaton might have had some, some of the same experience. 
I was a first assistant clerk magistrate in the housing court at the time that they expanded the number of judgeships in the housing court. And my, my boss, my clerk magistrate, who had been with the housing court for a very long time, was applying for the judgeship. So I, I chose not to um, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I, he, he deserved it. He, he deserved it. Um, and two, I, I was 38 at the time and I didn't feel like I deserved it. So I didn't apply. But then what happened was um, there was a, 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 a number of people who reached out to me and said, you need to apply. And so I remember having the discussion with my husband about, you know, what, what do I do? I, you know, and he said, if you, if you don't do this now, you'll, you'll, you may never be given this opportunity again. And uh, turns out he was correct. And uh, here I am. So, um, and, and in terms of preparing for it, I'll say to you, um, mine was, um, was rather a lengthy process. Uh, the others, I think, came after the reforms. I'm going to call them the reforms. So things went a little more quickly. But at the time I, I went for it, we had local, um, local committees that you went and interviewed before. And then those committees submitted your name to a larger committee. And then there was a meeting with the larger committee. And if your name went forward from there, uh, you then interviewed with the legal counsel for the governor and then with the governor. Um, my, my, my process from start to finish was over a year and a half. And um, that, that was a long time for, for to, to know where your future was going and also to be in an office where you're now um, competing with your boss for the same job. So that was a bit of an awkward uh, time period. So um, I, I think they've improved on that somewhat, um, how that, that goes, but that's how that happened. So in terms of preparing for it or um, campaigning for it, those kinds of things, that, that didn't happen in my case because I, I wasn't planning on it at the time, so. Wonderful. Uh, so then if I guess if you are planning on being a judge, uh, what would you recommend to law students uh, how to best prepare during law school um, for becoming uh, going down that path? So maybe I'll start off this uh, conversation and say that I took a look and there are 42,926 licensed attorneys in Massachusetts. Okay. 42,926. There are only 440 judges, and that includes state and federal judges. It's 41 federal and about 399 state court judges. And so I think I'm suggesting when you enter law school, you enter it with the mindset and the vision of being the best version of yourself being open-minded, experiencing things that you might not have thought you would enjoy or like. And ultimately those kind of goals and those, excuse me, qualities of hard work and getting along with people are timeless in nature. And I think my advice to you is, well, it's certainly way off in the distance and it's good to keep it that in sight as a very long-term goal. Use your time in law school to find out what you love to do because the practice of law is so varied and there are so many different things that can bring you joy. So there are 42,500 people who are lawyers who are not judges. I want you to be happy. I want you to feel satisfied. I want you to go to work and love it because you're gonna spend so much time there, whatever it is that you're doing, that you don't wanna compromise having that passion, having that energy. And so that's what I would suggest to you is you go into law school creating the best version of who you wanna be. 
I think going off of that, that we're always told maybe to practice in a certain area, then when we get out of law school, that would be better suited to going into a judgeship. Um, constantly told working in the DA's office is a great way to get into that or working in criminal law. Um, I see that, you know, Judge Eaton, you worked in family law for a while, and then you've made a niche in that as a judgeship in the juvenile court. Um, would, so would you recommend practicing law in, in a certain area or whatever suits best to you after you leave? And then on, tagging on top of that, how important really is a clerkship after law school? Well, you know, I, the type of clerk I was, was not a, a law clerk to a judge. I was a, a clerk managing the business of the court, which is, which is a different job altogether. Um, I will tell you that my first five years in practice, when I, I hung out a shingle and I tried a little bit of everything, um, I found that very valuable. You know, in law school, I told you I worked at a, at a big firm. So I had a chance to work on, you know, uh, trademark law and um, divorce law and you know a little bit of everything by working at a big firm as a as a um, as a as a law clerk there that that type of law clerk is you know writing um, uh, memoranda for attorneys um, to explain to them what the law is when they go into court they know what they're talking about and that that was the role there um, but um, I found going personally going into private practice and um, trying a little bit of everything. I did divorce work. I did criminal defense work. I did some, um, you know, employment law and and juvenile law. I uh, tried, tried various things and uh, getting a feel for what you're really, really drawn to. Because if you're going to practice it and if you're going to ultimately judge it, um, it you want to have something that really um, speaks to you where you feel like you can make a difference in that area of the law. And, um, and for some people that is, you know, tax law. I, I knew a very, very lovely um, tax attorney who really, really enjoyed um, dissecting um, all of those laws and giving advice to folks on, on, their, on their tax uh, choices. Um, it made no sense to me, but I understood that she was passionate about it. So, you know, it just depends on, on, on what you're drawn to, but you, you won't know if you don't try um, a few different things. And it's interesting that folks who've gone into municipal law or, or state law um, find themselves drawn to the judiciary because I think you, you start to see the whole picture of, um, of what the system does and what the system can do. I would also urge you to push yourself um, harder than you thought you ever could um, in law school. I certainly did. I, uh, I was not the most ambitious undergraduate student, but when I got to law school, um, you know, the gloves were off. I worked as hard as I could. I was, you know, up early in the morning. I was up late at night. I, I worked while I was going to school and I learned a lot. And um, it was some of the, the best experience of my life pushing myself to, to those limits in law school. So I, I do urge you to, to do that um, as part of your learning. Being muted. Uh, so it seems that um, Judge uh, Horan and uh, Judge Walsh, you both clerked and Judge Eaton and uh, McQuiggan did not clerk after law school, am I correct? Didn't oh, I, I didn't clerk. I was a first oh. assistant clerk. So again, with Judge Eaton, I was part of the court management of the housing court. So um, those law clerk positions you get directly out of law school. Um, I, I did not do that. I, I would say that you know that's a great a great opportunity. And, and one that I think many people strive for, but I absolutely do not think it's necessary um, in order to become a judge, obviously. Um, there's many of us that we're not, so. The only thing that I would say, just to add to it, is I absolutely agree, it's not necessary. Uh, it was an incredibly rewarding experience to clerk for a judge in an honor. Um, and then secondly, Throughout my career, it was always something that stood out. Uh, so the experience was invaluable. Uh, and then kind of the after effects, uh, it just uh, continued uh, 
to help me out through throughout my career. I'll just jump onto that. I didn't do a clerkship. Um, I, um, I, I wish I did, frankly, um, to this day, I wish I did. Um, I think it, I think it helps your writing skills immensely. And I would emphasize when you're thinking about preparing for the judiciary, no matter what court you're on, your writing skills are crucial. I did, I was a science major. I thought I was going to med school when I was an undergrad. So I wasn't writing journals or I wasn't taking writing classes. I was in a lab. Um, so I think the clerkships um, further develop your critical thinking and your writing skills um, in a way that um, really um, buttresses obviously what you're learning in law school, but takes it even a step further. Um, so I, I do think some of our best writers um, were clerks, were, had a clerkship. Um, and really great critical thinkers. Um, so again, not necessarily great to strive for, but absolutely not um, a prerequisite for the job, but um, certainly useful. I think that's great to hear. Um, I think it's so important to hear that there are so many different paths to judgeship um, and you don't just have to follow one single one. Something that maybe go along with that goes along with that is politics in the sense that when I came to law school, I thought I didn't even, you know, I kind of strayed away from that. How important is that in becoming a judge in that? Do you maintain a party line or do you not have to deal with that at all in your careers? Well, as a judge, we can um, have absolutely nothing to do with politics. Before becoming a judge as a lawyer, you know, we we could participate in the political process. Um, I, I chose never to do that. Others chose to actively um, involve themselves in that path. Um, sometimes it, it can work to your disadvantage and sometimes it can work to your advantage. Um, the reforms I talked about are, try, try very hard to take politics out of the um, judicial nomination process, um, you know, politics remain in some fashion, but uh, there's a real, real push to take all of that out of it and make it a, uh, a non-political process. So. If I could just add to that, um, as Judge Horan indicated, it can be a plus and a minus. Um, it can shoot you in the foot uh, and and lose you the potential for a judgeship or the opposite. Um, so I too like Judge Horn, partly because I was in municipal government, I worked in city hall um, because of the nature of the work we did, we had to very much stay apolitical and that served me well uh, going forward. Um, but fast forward, um, one of the last steps in our process to become a judge is to uh, be, to participate in a hearing before the governor's council. Um, the governor's council is a, an eight member elected body that has the final say about after a governor nominates you, they have the final say and the final vote um, as to whether you'll become a judge. Um, most of those eight members will reach out to you um, and try to meet with you or talk with you about your credentials before they vote on you. Um, I recall that one particular governor's counselor uh, told me before I even got one word out of my mouth that she was not going to vote for me because I worked in city hall with former Lieutenant Governor Tim Murray. And she had a real beef with the former Lieutenant Governor. So because I worked in city hall um, at a time frame that overlapped with uh, Tim Murray back when he was the mayor, she told me she was not gonna vote for me. So I, I had a conversation with her and told, of course, all of the uh, donation records are public records. So I said, you can look at the public records. I've never made a donation to his campaign. Um, frankly, I don't even know if he knows I'm sitting here in this room right now with you. Um, and uh, she turned around and she voted for me. Um, but I had to really dig myself out of a hole um, and I wasn't sure I would ever get there, but she did turn around and vote for me. So it just 
it just goes to show that it can be a real double-edged sword political activity. But once you once you get on the bench, your political activity has to, you can't even have a bumper sticker on your car or a campaign sign on your front lawn. Um, you have to be absolutely apolitical. I think so probably most important than that is probably just stand by your convictions. Don't support something you don't believe in then um, that way you don't Makes it easier to live with. Yeah, definitely. That, <laughs> that way you can at least stand by your um, your choices. It looks like Judge Grace raised her hand and might want to comment on this. Do you have something to say, Judge Grace? Yes. Um, first of all, um, the idea of the the idea of of discussing pathways to a judgeship while you're in law school um, feels a bit premature because you have to be out in the world and do something, it's called paying your dues. And you have to, whatever you're doing, you have to have a background. You can't get out of law school and whether you clerk, whether you clerk in the, as, as part of court management, if you're the clerk for somebody, um, it's a while before you, you really should, you should, whether you should apply for judgeship. Massachusetts is, is not unique. There are three or four other states who appoint judges the bulk of the country elects them. And when you elect judges, it's definitely much more political than it is. Mm -hmm. I was appointed 100 years ago by Governor Dukakis. And we used to say about him that he was he had such integrity that if he found himself in a whorehouse, he'd be checking the zoning to see if there was adequate parking. He, he just didn't yeah. allow <laughs> anything like, um, like po politics. And so you get, uh, you get First, you go before a judicial nominating council, which is different from what um, Janet was talking about with uh, the governor's council. That, those judicial nominating councils, they still have them. I don't know what the process is today, but they were untouchable. If anybody tried to call anybody on the judicial nominating council to influence them or advocate for somebody, you could be sure that your name would be out because it was just untouchable. And that integrity of the system made it much better. We, I think we are gifted in the fact that we have outstanding judges in Massachusetts. Um, there is, yes, there are some that are better than others, but we, have, we, we haven't had a whip, whiff of corruption or, or a lot of the things that befall many other states because our system of appointment is, is a very good one with very, very few judges who are not up to it being appointed. Those are great points. Um, we're, uh, you, you'll be getting a handout um, that is the overview of the judicial nominating process. So all of these steps that we're talking about with the um, governor's council, with the judicial nominating commission um, are summarized in this handout that um, it looks like uh, Ariel is circulating right now. Um, so don't go read it right now, read it later. Um, and I would agree. Um, so keep in mind that um, there are minimum requirements to be a judge um, in Massachusetts, and one of them is, is time out practicing. You have to have practiced for 13 years uh, to be an appeals court judge, and you have to have practiced for at least 10 years to be a trial court judge. So you definitely are obligated to cut your teeth somewhere and, and dig in and experience some different things. Um, the only thing I would say that that it's I, I, I agree with the dean that creating a pathway and planting the seed right now, um, I think is useful because there are a few things that you can keep in mind as guiding principles. One is work on your writing. Um, two is your reputation is everything. Um, so we talked uh, before the program started about um, being careful on social media. None of uh, most of us are not on social media. And if we are, it's in a very limited way. Um, we have um, the code of judicial conduct that steers us away from all of these things. But your reputation starts now. And it starts with every job you get. It starts with every time you stand in front of a court. Um, you're building your reputation brick by brick. Um, so it's important. Even the jobs that you take you're going to feel pressure if you're having trouble finding a job to take a job anywhere, doing anything. If you end up taking a job with maybe a firm that's not so reputable, unfortunately, that's going to travel with you like luggage. 
Um, so you, you're building your reputation brick by brick, and there are a few things that you can do um, to uh, maybe not prepare for a judgeship, but, but certainly um, uh, not put obstacles in your own way um, before you even get started. So build your reputation carefully. Um, take every opportunity you can to try something out, an internship, a job, paid or unpaid, um, but choose carefully um, and keep an eye on your reputation. Have a reputation for being prepared, for being thorough, for being honest. Um, it matters and it will go a long way. Um, and I, I wanna um, echo that, but also echo what Judge Eaton said. Um, when you get a job and you're in a courthouse, um, and I would say wherever you are, but treat everyone the same from the custodian that's walking out of the bathroom to the court officer who's going through your, your bag, to the clerks at the counter, to the, um, you know, the people that you're waiting online with. It is so important. I mean, I, I am where I am because I had the, the fortune of getting assigned to do code enforcement in the housing court. And so from City Hall, I would, um, I did all the code enforcement for the city of Worcester. And I learned everything I know from the people at the counter at the housing court. Everything I know that's important, I learned from them. And some of them are still here, God bless them. And, and I, I know this and they know it. <laughs> so treat, people with kindness and dignity from the get-go, from the get-go. And, and the other thing I wanted to echo is what Dean said he said, but I, but I would argue you don't, you don't start in law school, you start in high school, because I think we, we have to get the message out to women and, and people of color, apply to, to college, apply to law school know that this is a path that could be very rewarding for you. So, um, you know, that, that's my next project. And then just in case I don't get to speak again, and Mary Lou Muirhead will not speak to me if I don't get this out. Um, students can be members of the National Association of Women Judges for $35 a year. So look into that. There's a, a very robust website, NAWJ. So look into that. Um, and I, I call out Judge Muirhead because she was the driving force behind this project statewide. So thank you. I just want to add another thing to what Judge Horn and others have said, and it's specifically directed at the women who are law students right now. Um, we've had the opportunity in the West to uh, hear some horrific and just mind boggling stories of what other women attorneys and most of them judges had to deal with uh, going, being a woman in a quote unquote man's profession. And while I think times have changed, they haven't completely changed. And I can tell you when I was in law school, I didn't give much thought to my women law students. And I'm not suggesting that there aren't great male law students as well, okay? But what I'm suggesting is that they naturally have so many networking opportunities, is that I'm gonna suggest that you're stronger and better if you bond with one another. And it gives everyone an opportunity to learn from one another. And so I just wanna focus on when we retire, we wanna see the makeup of the judicial system to represent more of the community. The only way to do that is to not only plant the seed, is for you to support one another and for you to have confidence, right? Not being overly confident. We want you to be humble. We want you to treat people right. And I think you would anyhow but I don't want you to at all ever doubt the fact that you can do this job as good or better than any of your male counterparts. I find in my years, women have way more self-doubt 
right? We blame ourselves. Uh, you know, we're juggling more things and, and all the rest. And since we don't see ourselves in the bench in certain particular areas, I think we discount what makes us so great, right? So I just wanna encourage you to really work on kind of having that inner confidence and support network for all of you as you go forward in your careers. Wonderful advice from all of the judges today. Thank you so much. It looks like we have some questions coming in. Um, we have one that states, uh, for the judges that are mothers, how do you balance family life and being a judge? I'm going to say very carefully. Um, I, when I was appointed, I, I had a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. And um, it was challenging at times because uh, they didn't quite understand what mommy did for work. And they didn't understand why we couldn't do certain things that other people were doing. Um, and so that was difficult. There were security issues. Um, one time I had to get a, a restraining order. And, and so, you know, police had to be at their school and, and um, explaining that. There were more than one occasion where we'd be at a Wendy's or a McDonald's and I'd say, pick up your meal. We're going to finish in the car. And we, you know, run out to the car because someone came in that that I did not want to talk to. So um, challenging, very, very challenging. Um, and I've met your kids. I know your kids. For a decade, they thought that breakfast happened in the car at all times. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but um, you know, rewarding, but challenging. And, and I'll just echo that for a moment. Um, you know, I, I still have a, ch a, a, a child who's, who's in um, middle school and uh, I do still hear that, you know, why aren't you home more like the other moms? So, you know, you do have to balance uh, the, the, the parental guilt um, uh, with, with the demands of the child and uh, try to be your best, the best mom you can you know, on your off hours. <laughs> We have another question. Uh, any advice for those with a uh, disability, maybe either physically or mentally um, that have to have overcome that? So I'll just throw out, cause I, I just was on a panel for, um, uh, for judges uh, that would, had attorneys with disabilities, physical disabilities. And I was on the panel and I was born with cerebral palsy. So um, uh, my right side is affected by it. Hence the reason why my shoe was on the other side of the door in that story I told you. But um, the, what, what, what we came to the conclusion at, at the end of that panel discussion was that unlike many, many years ago when I was young and, and, and trying to hide my disability, um, you, you need to make your needs known. And so if you come into a, a courthouse or you yeah, come into a courthouse and you need something, you need to say something. And you, and, and you can do that in, in a number of ways. You can do it privately. You can ask to speak to the clerk. If you're in the courtroom, you can ask to come up to the sidebar with the judge. So, but a judge is not gonna know what they don't know. And so you have to make them aware of it so that they can make any accommodations you may need. Um, you know, I'll be honest, my first job uh, after the Commission Against Discrimination was Greater Boston Legal Services in the Disability Unit, because I thought this is what I was meant to do. And three years later, I realized it, it wasn't what I was meant to do. And, and I went to something else. So I would say, don't let your disability um, narrow your, your focus, um, but be mindful of it and, and speak up. Great advice. Yeah. I think that's wonderful uh, to hear. Uh, another question coming in. Uh, I'm wondering about other resume builders that don't necessarily have to do with your legal career. 
and how that would or could influence your judicial application and make you a more rounded, well-rounded candidate. Well, I think that's great. So anything outside, um, do you have any possess any expertise in another field or anything that maybe helped you get to the bench? So, I mean, this is a long process, right? It's a marathon. And in some ways you're not even realizing that you're running this race and coming over the finish line until much later. And so I'm gonna suggest to you that you don't pick things that would look good on a resume, right? So I love dogs, like really love dogs, okay? Now, is that an expertise in anything? It isn't. Well, guess what? Governor Patrick loves dogs as much as I love dogs. And we had this wonderful conversation when it was my time to be interviewed. And, you know, I wouldn't be my true self if I said, well, I think I need to volunteer at this or whatever. They do need well-rounded people, right? Not just book smart people or people who can uh, try a case or do whatever. I'll just speak for myself. When I applied to become a judge, I knew that there were a lot more smart, smarter men, women. They were people who graduated ahead of me. They had more expertise in certain areas. You're competing just with yourself, right? I didn't take this position and think I got it because I was the smartest person that ever existed. I think I got it in part because of all the qualities that we've all talked about, human qualities that will guide you through your life. So don't take the word judge, just take the word person, right? If something moves you, if you feel strong about something, just do it. And if it 10 years down the road makes you a kind of a more full picture of who you are, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's still great. You did something you loved. I really want you to just kind of forget that piece of it while you're putting in, in, as Judge Grace says, kind of paying your dues. You'll find going along that uh, it's the stuff at the bottom of your resume that's often the subject matter for these interviews. The <laughs> fact that you play the ukulele or you play a sport or you speak seven languages. Um, I played uh, intramural softball, co-ed intramural softball during law school. I missed uh, Supreme Court Justice um, Sandra Day O'Connor coming to Wake Forest University and speaking to the school because I was up at Virginia U University playing in a softball tournament. <laughs> My parents still haven't forgiven me for that one, but um, those are the things that uh, are, are conversation starters um, and can, can really uh, make an interview go well. And uh, that's, that's, there's some stuff at the bottom of your resume that, that will continue to be the subject matter of interviews and uh, help you bond with someone to get that job. Yeah, and um, I wanna echo what Judge Walsh said. I, I was not the smartest, um, nor am I the smartest um, by any means. Please don't discount common sense and <laughs> compassion because, oh my gosh, that's so important. And Martha Grace over there is known, known statewide for those very, very qualities. Yes. Thank you. I, I think that's really important to hear because I think when I first came to law school, there were so many pressures to be involved in so many things to boost my resume. And I got a little lost, I think, for a while there in having too many eggs and too many baskets. And then you get overwhelmed and it's not as enjoyable Rather, if you would have just picked a few select things that you actually enjoyed. I sat on so many committees where it's, I don't want to be on this committee, but yet I'm bound by it. And the things that I want to be on, you know, take maybe a back seat sometimes. Um, so I do know constantly um, looking at that, what, what, what makes you happy um, in the end, I think is a, a great thing. And also maintaining that um, sense of morality too. We, um, so I think ending on a, on a simple, would you choose this profession again if you had the chance? Uh, would you go back to, would you have stayed practicing as a lawyer or is this something that you, you really um, are happy doing? So I'm gonna say this has been an incredibly tough year 
But putting that aside, absolutely. I would agree. Um, I would do it, do it over and over again. Um, it's challenging. It's intellectually stimulating. It's different every day. Um, you're constantly learning. If you're the kind of person who enjoys constant learning, this is a great job for that. The one downside, once in a blue moon, you really just want to be an advocate for a position. Sometimes I miss being the, the fighter in the fight and uh, sometimes being the referee gets tiring. Um, but overall, um, just really stimulating, challenging, constantly learning. And it's, you know, the kind of job that you can grow old into, I suppose. And I would add that a, that a good trial or a good hearing is a beautiful thing. Um, if you've been at this long enough and you get to watch attorneys at their best, doing their best work, fighting the, the fight as hard as they can, um, it, it is one of the most enriching experiences. And it's, it's just a gas. It's really, really um, intellectually stimulating, but also just emotionally fulfilling to watch folks um, stand up for other folks. Um, in a courtroom. So I, I really encourage you to, to see yourself in that role because, because it is, um, it's one of our privileges is to watch good lawyers um, doing good lawyering. I would just, uh, I just want add to, say, to say that, oh, oh go ahead, Judge Nectum, I'm no, so I just, sorry. You know, I, I'm so sorry for being late. <laughs> On behalf of NAWJ and this, the, the collaboration, I want to say thank you to everyone. Forgive me for, for being late. And I, I know I, I missed a lot, but I love Janet, your comment about uh, uh, Martha Grace, and I've been trying to fill her shoes for now almost six years uh, in, in the juvenile court, but everything you said is true. But I just wanted to add one thing about mentoring and that all of you that are listening, uh, we as judges are, are always the first to, to be there to step up to say, you know, let me help you, let me guide you through the process. You may have already spoken about that, if I did, forgive me, but uh, we're all willing to, to help others, and especially women along the way. So again, thank you and forgive me for being late. Sorry, Maureen. No, no, I'm so glad you said that. And I would just say it's the greatest honor and privilege that I could think of, of being, which is a member of the Massachusetts judiciary. Thank you so much, everyone. I know we're close to the top of the hour and um, uh, we, we did get a lot of questions coming in. Um, we'll certainly keep this on if anyone wants to hang around. I did also put in the chat a couple upcoming events that we have through the Center for Social Justice. Um, we have a intersection of law and occupational therapy panel focused on disability rights. That's happening um, next week on Tuesday from 1230 to two. Registration is on Zoom. Um, all these are on the Center for Social Justice website, which I'll also place in the chat. Um, we have an upcoming panel with CPCS to learn about hanging your shingle and working as an advocate um, on uh, indigent client cases as both trial and appellate counsel. And then we have a, for the public, a virtual sealing and expungement event uh, where we are going to be helping people run their criminal records and then advising them about uh, whether they're eligible for sealing and expungement. And there's a legal training for that that's happening on April 22nd from 1230 to 2.30 with um, recent Adams Award winner, attorney um, Crispin Birnbaum. So um, if you're on our list, you will get information about all of those or please feel free to contact me if you're interested. And again, just thank you so much to our panelists. It was really amazing to hear your personal stories. I appreciate your honesty and um, for sharing yourself with us in this way and hopefully um, certainly inspiring those who've attended tonight to um, try to step into some of your shoes eventually. So thank you so, so much for being here. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn off the recording and we'll stick around. We're doing great work.